thank you so much. I have to apologize in advance for my lost voice, which I regained about 30 minutes ago. So if I, if I lose it again, please bear with me. Uh, I may have to stop and uh, whisper, maybe. Can you actually understand what I'm saying? No? Fine. Right, uh, so um, I have to maybe apologize to those of you who know my story. Uh, you'll see some slides you've seen before, and some of you will have seen some glimpses, including in the talk I gave not so long ago here in this, in this auditorium. Uh, but to me, uh, shifting from many years of auditory research to actually presenting language visually has been a, a major uh, step, even though it wouldn't look like uh, that to you. So the work, uh, even though I'm now representing uh, Center of Functional Integrative Neuroscience in, in Aarhus, in Denmark, since a few months ago, the work uh, was actually done in, in Cambridge, in Helsinki, and in St. Petersburg, uh, what I'm going to talk about. So the question that already arose in some of the previous um, talks is to what extent language is, is automatic or whether it draws on, on some attentional resources. Uh, and the ease with which we can perceive the entire complexity of, of language has prompted suggestions that this function is to a large degree automatized. And this automaticity has been so far suggested for practically all levels from phonological analysis to lexical morphological, semantic, syntactic uh, levels, all the way up to the level of, of dialogue. And as we were walking this morning uh, here, I was whispering to uh, Andrea and Alexander about some studies done in Orcus where when people communicate, their heart rate uh, becomes synchronized. So this uh, automaticity, and, uh, which, which, happen with, which happens automatically, obviously, you don't consciously control that. So, it permeates different levels, but today we'll only talk about single word processing, that is, lexical access. And uh, something that we used repeatedly in, in sort of 10, 10 uh, 12 years ago, in the beginning of this research program, to, to look into this is to present spoken words in auditory modality when subjects are not paying any attention. And uh, in these first studies, they, we used just a few words, which were presented in unattended old ball paradigm and used mismatch negativity as a, as a measure of choice. And I'm re very glad Taya yesterday introduced the MMN response in, in great detail, so I don't have to, to do it now. And what you see when it, what it happens when you listen, when you're actually not listening, but just hearing to the words and pseudo words that somebody is, that, that have been played to you and you're doing something else, you get a solid increase of of word-related response over pseudo words. This is MEG data. Uh, you also get it in, in EEG and, and fMRI as well. And importantly, since this is not a, a, a very natural paradigm, an oddball, oddball design is not something we used to communicate with each other every day, uh, you can find uh, the same effect when you present stimuli that are not repetitive, that don't have oddball paradigm, but uh, as long as you match the acoustic properties, such as in this work by Lucy McGregor and, 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 and colleagues, which we uh, published a couple of years ago, uh, we presented uh, more than a hundred of acoustically and psycholinguistically matched words and pseudo words, and we found the same phenomenon. We found that the brain reacts more strongly to unattended spoken words than pseudo words, the dashed line is pseudo words, throughout this, this is just a global response of the MEG signal. And you can see how this activity can be modeled uh, in sources that in, te in temporal, inferior, frontal, and precentral areas, gradually spreading in time from 50 milliseconds up to 420 milliseconds, spreading to inferior frontal areas. So this enhanced uh, response specific to lexicality as the property of, of uh, stimulus, uh, can be elicited when attention is withdrawn from the stimuli and there is no stimulus-related <coughs> tasks. And importantly, it's observed when you balance carefully the acoustic, physical, phonetic properties that are the biggest variable that influence your, your responses. We've seen it in dozens uh, of mismatch negativity studies, which were replicated by groups in different countries. Uh, and and we've also seen it in non mismatch negativity in multi-item designs, as I've just shown. And this enhancement has uh, 
was, it was repeated in many papers, is best in explained by activation of long-term memory traces. So you automatically activate a memory trace for a word when you hear it, even when you don't pay attention. And you start this from about 50 milliseconds after the information arrives. So the take-home message from these background studies is that the spoken word processing is rapid and automatic. And why would that be like this? And the reason for that is whatever you have as a representation for your word, as an entry in your mental lexicon, must be a very robust thing. It's, it's, it's likely a robust neuronal network that has that encoded the words a long time ago and gets activated robustly and, uh, and, and strongly every time you're presented with this, with this word, even when you're not paying attention. There is no such representation for a pseudo word, there were, there, therefore there is no activation to the same degree. Now, of course, when we make this suggestion uh, that uh, of word memory traces being, being distributed circuits that are robust and automatically activated, then there, is, there should be no reason why this is only true in the auditory modality. And therefore, we could hypothesize that this account should predict automatic activation of word memory traces in any modality, whether it's auditory or visual, or perhaps even some, some, some other modality, if you think of maybe blind or, or deaf people. So, uh, but at the same time, experiments in the visual modality have not been able to test this prediction, as usually it's difficult to pretend, pre present a visually unattended word. If it's something that you're looking at, it's automatically in the focus of your attention. Now, there is a whole body of research done with masked visual stimuli, when subjects may not be aware that they've seen a stimulus, but there is an important difference. It's usually a word or sort of word or something else that's flashed in the center of the screen where the subject is paying attention to, and then there is a mask that uh, covers the same space just a few milliseconds later. So you may not be aware that you've seen it, but you are still paying attention to it. So it's not exactly the same thing as the finding that we, we had in the auditory domain. So what we did, and this is the, the, the first of the studies I'd like to show, is, was actually done here at the uh, uh, Department of Neurophysiology on the other side of the river uh, by my master's student, Galina Garyanova, who, um, with the help of, of uh, the team here, uh, tried to implement the uh, design we, we previously used in audition in the visual domain. So this is closely following the most bog standard lexical MMN study where you have multiple, devi multiple standards and a few deviants and you, we, uh, we control uh, the contrast, so the contrast between the deviant and the standard is always the same, uh, but they are the lexical words or the, the pseudo words and the subjects are distracted from, from, from these stimuli. So what you have here is the central stimulus uh, which is a combination of different circles like presented here of different colors and in each block the subject is asked to detect a certain color combination. So if they ask to detect inner green, outer red, then this is the only right target the reverse would not work. The outer green, inner red would be a wrong answer. So this is a so-called dual task, but you have to keep track of two, two features, both colors and locations. And this was well shown in, in the attention research uh, on some other aspects, that when you have to trace two features at once, this really restricts your attention spot. That was shown by, by John, John Duncan and others, for example, really restricts your attention spot to this, to this location. And these things were present there all the time, just changing with, I think, of every, every 900 milliseconds or so. At the same time, 2.5 degrees from the center, these words were flashed uh, for just 100 milliseconds. So there was no time for subjects to saccade to them. And to, to reduce saccades, we presented them symmetrically on the left and right sides. Uh, so actually, many, many subjects did not even, did not report seeing the words at all. So, what we had were these different combinations of um, uh, words and pseudo words. The critical thing is the contrast between, uh, between the standard and deviant stimulus is always the same. It's K versus N, and it's phonetically the same as well, since Russian is more or less transparent. So you get talk ton, mokmon, 
and there are so some of these are pseudo words and some of these are words, and it's all combinations, standard words, deviant words, and all possible all possible uh, reiterations. In addition, we had um, stimuli that made no sense but included the same contrast, so these hash mark ampersand k, hash mark ampersand n, and finally a separate condition where we only had the circles and no no uh, orthographic stimuli. So, and this is the result of of uh, sort of global, this is just 30 channels of EEG. Uh, this is just global activation, which showed three main peaks across all electrodes at, at times which we know from previous attention visual language research. At 100 milliseconds, you always get a response to visual stimulus. At 250, you have uh, something that's been linked to orthography processing by uh, various groups, uh, by uh, uh, most prominently by the group of uh, Manuel Carreras. And finally, you have something in the uh, 400 millisecond vicinity. And this, this, what we did here was remove the baseline condition. So the, the, just the circles condition is subtracted from uh, the orthographic conditions to remove the global visual activation because, of course, most of the activity is caused by these huge uh, colorful shapes, not by the, the uh, tachystoscopic words. And then we start looking. We started looking at, at these main peaks to see how they differ for different stimulus types. And what we see, much to, um, and what, which is what was what we predicted, is a large activation for meaningful words as opposed to match pseudo words. You see a huge peak that's then repeated again and again with time. And in the earliest in the earliest uh, peak, there is no difference between words and non-words. You can see that later, and these remember these are unattended and unnoticed words and pseudo words. There is later a difference where pseudo words start eliciting activation similar to words, and non words already are uh, possibly suppressed, not analyzed. <coughs> right. And then the other, uh, of course, thing to look into such, in, in such a design is whether we get what's known as mis the mismatch negativity. And there is a visual uh, analog of the mismatch negativity. Uh, which was previously shown with like uh, moving lines and, and uh, circles, simple stimuli. And here we see uh, that yes, we can elicit in the same way as before as this um, anterior negativity. The, the, this is TVN's minus standards, and this is the subtraction. So you see frontal positivity accompanied by left lateralized uh, negativity, which is a more or less a standard signature of a visual MMN. Even though we see this, and it's significant in the first two, two uh, peaks, uh, interestingly, this does not interact with the lexicality. So we saw it for all stimuli, and at the same time, we didn't see that standards or devi deviants were sort of uh, different to reflect in lexicality. So what we see is a visual analog of the lexical European enhancement here for the first time, unattended written words producing larger brain responses, uh, very early on than, than pseudo words. We also see visual and mismatch negativities for the first time seen for orthographic stimuli. However, unlike the auditory modality, we don't see specificity of these responses to, to words or pseudo words. So in the auditory modality, we specifically see MMN enhancement, and here we see lexical enhancement for both TVNs and standards, accompanied by, by uh, discrimination, MMN in addition. So there, is, there seems to be a high degree of similarity with the early auditory research suggesting similar or even a shared mechanisms of unattended language access in both modalities. And uh, these early and automatic lexical uh, processes in, of visually presented language seem to take place very quickly, very rapidly, uh, outside the focus of the visual attention under strong distraction from the linguistic processing. Of course, with these 32 channels, e.g., um, we couldn't uh, do much about the uh, sort of brain sources of these, uh, these um, effects. So we did, in parallel to this, uh, we did uh, a similar study in, in Cambridge using MEG, and uh, that's, uh, that was uh, done primarily by, by uh, Claire Cook and, and uh, Lucy McGregor, and was subsequently uh, analyzed by, by Francesca Carota, whose, whose results I'll, I'll show in, in a second, where a similar design was used. Again, all possible combinations oops, of the same uh, um, 
visual and also acoustic contrast, always T versus R, here, but different, different combinations of uh, standards and deviants be, being either words or pseudo words. And now they had to detect a combination of colors located one above one each other, and the stimuli were in peripheral 1.5 degrees from the center space. <coughs> Now, again, we started sort of being agnostic to, to what could come out of this. We started by pulling all channels together and just analyzing global responses. And again, we got something distinct from the previous design, uh, but not, not that different responses, starting from 100 and then dying after 250 milliseconds out. When we looked at this in signal space, and this is just to remind you what it says, it's, it's the, the brighter the color, the stronger the uh, MEG field, and you're looking at this helmet space from the left side. Uh, we see that early, already early on you have this visual analog of mismatch negativity. Interestingly, uh, the first and the strongest response is already in the frontal channels, not in the occipital ones. And then it sort of keeps circulating, comes back to the occipital channels. And these are all significant results in signal space. These are T values. Actually, these are not activations, these are T values. And when we look at uh, lexicality effects, again, starting from this very first peak at 100 milliseconds, we see a strong uh, significance of enhanced word over pseudo word response in temporal occipital sensors already creeping into, into frontal sensors. And this process goes on uh, for longer. So in the source space, I think I'm sure you can see the colors, uh, but the upper line is, again, just mis mismatch negativity, and lower line is, is lexicality effect. So the brighter color is stronger deviant than, uh, uh, than standard response. And you have this for the orthographic differences in uh, most significant, these are T values, again, not activations. So the, the brightest doesn't mean this is the biggest overall activation. Of course, the biggest activation is in your visual areas. But the big, biggest differences are not, the most significant differences are not. So for the visual mismatch negativity, we get already here uh, broker area, uh, uh, BA4445, involved as well as motor regions, and uh, superior and posterior temporal regions between 150 and 240 milliseconds. And the lexicality differences uh, in source space, start later than in signal space. We couldn't see them at 100, but we could see them here at 180 milliseconds. Again, in left inferior frontal areas and later uh, around uh, pre-central regions. So, of course, the, these two studies are subject to the same confound I mentioned in relation to the early, to the early mismatch negativity work, which is this is not a typical. <coughs> this is not a typical way you deal with language. Uh, you don't typically see stimuli that are repeated hundreds of times um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in, in such a design. But I must say that in itself, it's not such the way these unattended stimuli are presented. It's not so untypical. It's sort of what you often face when you're looking at something on a bus and you uh, see the advertising flashing on the side. It may not be in the focus of your attention, but you're exposed to such things all the time. Uh, so, but what, what is unnatural is, is the repetition of the same few stimuli, although I must stress that the key thing there was to control these tiny features, like have exactly the same contrasts, have them matched for psycholinguistic factors, and so on. But finally, we need to do something that's more va uh, sort of valid ecologically. So we uh, repeated this study uh, together with Lucy McGregor in Cambridge to expose our subjects to again over a hundred words that are matched for various for various properties with a similar group of pseudo words and each one is only played once and subjects are again doing this combination of spheres detection task which is non-linguistic doesn't and doesn't encourage language processing in any way what we get then what we get then is um, a difference that starts very early on, and these are MEG responses. Uh, here on the bottom is the temporal channels, and these are the maps of the differences. So 
the first difference occurs at 90, again, the same times at 90 milliseconds in temporal lobe. You see this, um, or in temporal sensors, you see this increase for uh, meaningful words as opposed to meaningless pseudo words. This is how it looks in, in time here. Just 60 milliseconds later, this difference uh, has moved to inferior frontal uh, sensors further here on the left. So you have this transfer of information going on quite rapidly in the same non attend design. Later, and only later, the difference inverts, and then you see already a larger pseudo word activation at 230 uh, milliseconds in temporal sensors. In source space, and uh, this is preliminary source space, is, uh, since putting this picture together, we've also done a, uh, statistics in source space, but just to say that in source space we seem to see uh, a constellation of occipital, uh, temporal, including inferior temporal and anterior temporal, and finally uh, frontal sources underlying this enhancement. So, we replicate our finding of, of lexical differences in unattend design when words uh, hundreds of words and pseudo words being flashed at subjects who are not doing anything with them and are doing non-linguistic tasks. At the same time, we find the same time course of events. So the brain seems to, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing uh, with, with uh, conclusions, the brain seems to differentiate unattended orthographic stimuli very rapidly after stimulus onsets. It, uh, we can see it as, as, a, as a mismatch negative, it is for uh, orthographic stimuli, or for any orthographic stimuli, even if they're meaningless. Uh, but in addition to this, we can see that the brain dissociates meaningful written words from meaningless uh, pseudo-word inputs, which also happens very early on when subjects aren't paying attention and the task itself does not even encourage linguistic processing. So it's not like in a study that, for example, mentioned yesterday by Ishton Winkler, when subjects were listening to sounds and were distracted by a book, which is still perhaps could be preactivating linguistic input here, subjects are doing something completely irrelevant for language. And, and, and yet, we seem to see uh, that the language system is activated. Uh, and it, this, this, it's, it's activated in form of exhibit a temporal frontal network, uh, which must be then underpinning this automatic word recognition process. This automatic process of, of uh, lexical access could perhaps so could therefore be a supramodal a neural mechanism as we see it in both uh, visual and auditory modalities and it must be shared by these modalities. And uh, these early stages, these early stages which you can see for unattended stimuli uh, should be the earliest uh, pro processing stages of linguistic information taken taking place before attentionally dependent processes come into play, which we know from other studies happens uh, one, two hundred milliseconds later. Uh, I'll uh, need to uh, thank all the people who were involved in this work, Kalina and Anna here, Clara, Lucy, Francesca and Martin in, in, in Cambridge, Sergey here, and, uh, Sergey and Alex from here as well, and Medical Research Council, Council for, their, for their funding. They funded me for long uh, 13 years. Russian government, uh, Ministry of Science and Education funded the work done here, and European Commission has also provided a lot of gen uh, general, generous support, and of course many others. And thank you for, your, for bearing with my uh, uh, voice for the last uh, 20 minutes. Right, questions, one here. Oh, thanks for the talk and for <laughs> doing this effort. Uh, I've got one question and one comment. Uh, the question is, uh, didn't you directly compare uh, the full attention and uh, un inattention conditions? Because uh, actually we did it uh, for the word superiority effect and uh, it turned out that uh, in full attention, uh, words are similar to pseudo words and non-word differ. And, and, uh, inattention conditions, condition uh, words are uh, separated from both pseudo words and non words. I mean, uh, yeah, so you get it. That's, that's exactly true. So this is exactly what there is. We haven't done this in visual modality, although one of these experiments has also an attended uh, component. And there we, it's preliminary, but we seem to be seeing exactly what you said. That is, and what we see 
often, most often, is that words, the earliest peak of activation for words, doesn't change with the task. It's, it's the same, but the, the, it's the pseudo word activation that changes. When you start paying attention, then it grows, and depending on the amount of attention you give to it, it may reach the same level, or it may even go up, go higher. And the explanation is, of course, you have those memory traces, they become active, and they're just active at ceiling, at least the first, in the, in the first uh, 100, 150 milliseconds. So the words don't have those traces. They, <coughs> they don't activate, they, therefore, they, in non-attend conditions, they have produ reduced activation. However, as soon as you start doing something to them, paying attention, then something comes into play. Perhaps you're trying to find, find uh, a possible explanations, or perhaps our neighbors uh, get activated in, in the cohort uh, model uh, way of thinking. You activate multiple neighbors. They are never fully activated, but there could be many of them. And therefore, then the activation goes up. Okay. Hey, so it's a really, really, really uh, interesting. Um, so you've made this point about uh, these effects occurring um, uh, sort of uh, w under the threshold of language processing or that language processing isn't involved. But I guess there, there is kind of a linguistic component here in the sense that, uh, you know, if my brain's seeing something that has stimulus features that make it look like a word, uh, the expectation is that it, it's going to be a word, right? Um, right. If I'm in a context where I'm supposed to see a word, I should see see a word. Uh, if you're looking at a sign, you know, there's something that's there and it looks like a word. So the, I guess the question I have is uh, whether or not, especially I guess you could do this in your MEG data, whether or not you could uh, could find something that looks like an adaptation effect. That is, hey, I'm in this context where I, you know, seeing things, they should be words, but over the course of the experiment, you're going to learn to downweight the expectation that you're really going to see a word. And if that's the case, then you should, you should be able to, to pull out some uh, nice kind of learning effects, I, I which have, would support your story, I think. Yeah, I don't have a direct answer to your, to your question, uh, since this hasn't been tested as, as you're putting this, but of course you're right in both ways, that there should be some prediction, but we still measure timing from the point in time when the information is enough to, to differentiate what you're getting. And uh, we, what we seem to see, like when we have this highly predictive design, the mismatch negativity design, when you have, you know, type, 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 tight, type, 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 then, then you, we, we have a robust effect about 100 20 to 200 milliseconds. As soon as we moved to a less predictable design, where we had 100 of words and 100 of pseudo words mixed randomly, uh, we have that. And in addition, we have something coming up at 50 milliseconds. So it seems like uh, there, the, in repetitive designs, you have habituation, which is re removed in, in these non-repeat designs. And when sort of investigating this, what you just mentioned, investigating uh, events across, uh, across, the, uh, across um, the course of one block, I think I saw, but didn't, it didn't come out as significant, that in the earliest sort of trials, these effects are much earlier than, than later. And we've now run, although unrelated to, not the visual study, but uh, Lily Kimpa in Helsinki, uh, PhD student whom uh, Tay and I co-supervise has uh, done a learning uh, design with multiple words and pseudo words and non-words, all mixed up. Uh, and she found uh, strong learning effects at 50 milliseconds. Yeah, uh, just a just point of, of clarification, because I'm curious. With the properties of the MEG signal, uh, you could feasibly do some sort of continuous trial by trial analysis where you don't need to bend, because bending it, it sacrifices a large amount yes, of power, think, especially think, because these are early right. effects. You might be pushing, we might be pushing it with trial by trial, but I think maybe, you know, the uh, tens, tens, of dozens of trials uh, at once would probably, probably get, uh, work. Okay, uh, do we have more questions? I, I, one problem I have is, what do you mean by automatic? Um, I mean, if a stimulus hits the retina or the eardrum, it's, it's obligatorily, it's going to just propagate through the system um, to some extent. Um, and then what that, that's automatic, that's, I guess. That's automatic. And what's, yeah, it's, what, it's, when, when does it stop becoming potentially automatic in that sense? What, what, how much room for manoeuvre does a 
does the actual well, I think process the key system thing have? Maybe, maybe, uh, yes, everything is automatic in a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I usually carefully say that it's automatic in a sense that it doesn't require focused attention. That's sort of a very broad distinction. So you don't need to concentrate on language input or, in fact, to be conscious of that, to process it as such. Right. But if I, if I say to you, the red dog, right, and you say, ask what, is the processing of that automatic or not? It seems to imply that you envisage a, a possible world where I hear the and red and dog, and I don't try to integrate it into a, a phrase. Um, and it's only because I attend to it or I wish to interpret it like that that I can um, achieve that phrasal representation. But you don't mean that, do you? No, I don't mean that. I think I mean something more basic, like I've just described. And in fact, you do, you also seem to parse things automatically very early on and, 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 and combine them in the same way. Uh, but later on, if you look at responses that start accumulating after sort of 100, 50, 200 milliseconds. They strongly depend on attention, and so including N400, for example, which almost disappears in non-attend designs. So to to uh, actively understand that these, you know, uh, he has his tea with with milk and, and socks around the sugar to to to, directly un to actually understand that this is wrong, you do need to focus to allow more resources, which probably means disinhibit the relative areas. Uh, and allow more, more resources for them to analyze the input, uh, maybe re, uh, re, rather reanalyze, reparse the input again. Right. I don't think we have agreed with that. Do we have more questions? <coughs> I actually have a quick one uh, before you go. Uh, so these words that you show people uh, compared to pseudo words, did you test whether they are later available for conscious access by means of, I don't know, recognition uh, accuracy or something like that. In most of the experiments, we ran these we ran the questionnaires yes. on subjects, uh, and in not in all, but especially when, when the first experiment, when they were presented paraphorically, so further 2.5 degrees from the center, it was something like nine out of 16 didn't report seeing anything. Well, that's a different question altogether. Well, I mean, mean, whether they whether they whether, what what they think of them? Yeah, they rate them as meaning less or meaning full even after being exposed to them. As so they're country. better, their accuracy. So for example, if you show them in a list of words, will, they be be will you have any implicit uh, signature no, have of them recognizing no, this thing? Have not done that, no, have not done that. That, that would be, you know, kind of a little uh, um, toward the direction of how it, where it's automatic, where it actually enters the process and stream, right. and where it ends. I mean, this is just a, a reflex. I know you use this method for a lot, that it's a reflex. Uh, but then, does it, does it allow access I, to meaning? I should actually, I should correct myself a little bit. Uh, we actually did a study like, uh, a kind of what, what you suggested when subjects with, with Max Garniani and, and Matt Davis in Cambridge, but that behavioral study was linked to a, to um, a fMRI experiment where we wanted to see how these things are learned and how many trials you may, to need, uh, to, you may need and whether it requires attention. And it seems like when you really bombard subjects with many trials, uh, you know, like 200 trials, without having them attend to them, they still, <coughs> they're still better at, it interferes with their lexical decision task the following day. If you don't bombard them with many, then it doesn't. I think that's my memory of results. Okay. Which still have to be analyzed. All right. Uh